We have another initiative from Landscape Ontario's COVID-19 Task Force. And while much of this isn't exactly COVID related, um, the task force is keeping their ear to the ground and wanting to make sure that we are talking about the issues that are affecting you right here and right now. So the task force is presenting the special webinar discussion on how business owners can manage rising fuel costs and how suppliers are dealing with uh, freight and logistical challenges. My name is Joe Salami. I'm Landscape Ontario's Deputy Executive Director. And I'll be moderating a discussion today with uh, Peter Ginnan of Oriel Landscaping, Ed Hansen of Hansen Lawn and Garden, as well as James Riddell from Site One and uh, Adam Taylor from Global Action, or sorry, um, Export, Action love, Export Action Global. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> appreciate that. Sorry. Um, and all about how we can, uh, and owners can mitigate the impact of rapidly rising fuel costs um and how we're all dealing with that there's been a tremendous amount of conversation within the landscape ontario community on the best ways to handle the rising costs of fuel materials labor and freight just to name a few we're all uh we're represented really well with the group that we have on our panel um and i would like to start the conversation off uh, with Jamie and Adam. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce Adam a little bit. Um, he is someone that I'm not sure that uh, we've all uh, had the opportunity to meet. Uh, Adam is a seasoned public affairs professional and a recognized expert in international trade. He's been a senior trade and economic advisor to a Canadian prime minister and several high profile cabinet ministers and business leaders around the world. Uh, Adam connects businesses and organizations with trade and investment related opportunities in Canada, throughout North America, and in markets around the world. He's currently the president and co-founder of Export Action Global, a public affairs and management consulting firm specializing in market entry, assessing political risk and creating movements to ensure optimal policy outcomes. Jamie and Adam, I'd like to uh, hand it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I know this is a, a, a very significant topic to all of us today as you know, all of all of these different things impact all these different increasing costs impact our businesses in very uh, in many different ways. Um, we can talk about logistics impacting us from an availability standpoint, we can talk about supply chain and the uh, increasing costs of fuel trucking in general, not just fuel. Um, and uh, how, how much that's impacting the cost of goods that we are trying to sell. And we could talk about the tiers of all these different things and how many, how many different points along the supply chain line um, is it impacting our cost of goods? What, is our, you know, what, what are the bigger impacts to us as uh, business owners and operators? So we've invited Adam here to, to talk to us a little bit about um, the, the world of logistics right now, the state of where, where it is, um, and where it could be in the future and to have and to share some ideas and suggestions and to listen and, and answer some questions as we see um, as questions come up. So Adam, the floor is yours if you would like to uh, share your screen and, and take over for your presentation. Sure. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, uh, thank you everyone um, for having me. I'll, I'll start off by I have a short presentation um, just to talk about some stuff in a high level way and then I, I thought I We'll obviously uh, save uh, the bulk of our, our time, hopefully, to answer questions. I'll put my email in the chat as well. I'll say it. it's adam at exportactionglobal.com, um, and I'll, I'll write that in the chat here. Um, but if anybody has specific questions um, that they want answered or specific ideas or even scenarios they want to chat about privately offline, I'm happy to do so um, because we've been involved a lot in some of these logistics and, and supply chain problems that have, have started to really manifest during COVID. Um, but as my presentation will get into today, um, we believe they've been in existence long before COVID. Um, and in fact, COVID sort of became the tipping point. Um, but I'll get into that in one second. But I'll first share my screen and get my PowerPoint going. I hope everyone can now see it. Um, so as said, uh, our firm is called Export Action Global. You can check us out online. Um, my phone number is up in the corner here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and then my email put in the chat. Um, but um, we're, we're a firm that just helps businesses either 
bring stuff into the country in a short and easy way. We, we help businesses and organizations export from Canada or, or import into Canada for the most part um, across a few specific sectors, machinery and equipment, um, raw materials, natural resources, agriculture and agri-food, to name a few. And so uh, this is a, a, obviously a, a great group to be chatting with because I know a lot of you are, are reliant on these, these cross-border um, issues and, and are now affected by a lot of the cross-border challenges. Um, so I'll just start off by just giving a quick, a quick snapshot as to why we actually care about some of these things, um, especially with a, with a focus on the Canada-US trading relationship. So Canada-US trading relationship um, across all goods and services is about $750 billion annually. That is equals, you know, nearly, I think you can get to a million dollars a minute, literally, if you try, um, and, and billions per day. And it's, um, so it's obviously Canada's most significant and uh, an important trading relationship. I, um, I think all told, 38 states um, consider Canada their number one customer, and Canada, I think 75 or 74 percent um, of Canadian exports go to the U.S. market. So, so pretty big um, for both for both sides. Canada, especially, dependent on the United States, obviously, for our trade. 65 um, percent of all trade um, across the Canada-U.S. border is done by truck, um, and that's unique. Most most trade between countries is done by either container ship or, or air cargo for the most part. So it's Canada, the Canada-US relationship is truly unique in that the majority of our trade is actually done by truck at the, at the land border crossings, of which there are 126 points of entry on the Canada-US border, um, which is also, I think, we have the longest un, unguarded border in the world and the most border points of entry um, between any two countries that are doing active trading with each other in the world. So truly sort of a, when you look at the Canada US market, you almost look at it as, a, as an integrated market. If we include the Cosma, the, the, the third Cosma partner, Mexico, then we can obviously even look at Canada, US and Mexico as its own North American production platform where we're making things across the border. Often things are crossing the border several times before finished goods are made. We don't look at trade anymore. Uh, you build a car in Mexico and export it to the United States or export it to Canada. You're building off the, you know, the, the, the braking system and, the, and some of the parts in one country, then it's all being shipped to another country for assembly and then it's being shipped to a third country for, for final assembly and then off to a dealer network somewhere. So in the auto industry, they say sometimes before a finished car is made, things are going back across the border up to a dozen times. We see that in agriculture and agri-food as well, where a lot of inputs, whether it's ingredients or crop inputs, are traveling back across the border several times. This is known as sort of the trade in intermediary goods as opposed to the trade in, in finished goods. Um, I think at the, at the end of the day, the current statistics show that border officials in both countries are processing 50 million cars and 12 million trucks annually. So this is sort of shows that, that trucking is, um, is obviously the, uh, is, is a huge part of the, of the, of the, of the commerce that happens between those two countries. And, and when that starts to erode, um, then this is where the problems can you know, start to occur as we're now seeing in COVID. Um, when we look at trucks, some specific numbers, 15,000 trucks enter either side. So 15,000 trucks on average go to the United States daily from Canada and enter Canada from the United States. So, so two ways, 15 trucks daily, um, almost two thirds of these trucks are operating between Ontario and New York State and, and Michigan. Um, the Ambassador Bridge in, in Michigan is processing nearly 20% of all trucking trade. We saw a few weeks ago when, when the convoy had disrupted trade there, they were saying it was, it was, I think at one point they were estimating it was $300 million a day just by having that bridge closed. Um, so that goes to show you just how much, how much trade traffic is going through that particular border crossing. Um, other big ones are Sarnia, Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, and the Pacific Highway in BC. Um, so, so these are some of the big ones, um, but just goes to show you uh, that a lot of this trade is, for, with, with the exception of, of British Columbia, a lot of this trade is very central to Ontario and, and these two sort of border states um, of New York and Michigan. Um, obviously, we know we trade a whole bunch of things. Some of the key trade inputs, um, that, or some of the key trade goods, I, I, say, I should say, are agriculture inputs. Um, agri-food products, including fresh food, the Ambassador Bridge, there's tons of fresh food coming back and forth across the borders and then getting stored in some of those massive terminals that exist in uh, various parts of the province. Um, so fresh food was one of the biggest things that got sort of potentially affected when, 
when the convoy had blocked trade at the Ambassador Bridge. Um, of course, across many sectors, uh, manufacturing inputs and goods, auto parts the, for the auto sector, we see lots of steel, aluminum, raw natural resources, forestry products, um, on and on and on um, for uh, manufacturing and all the manufacturing subsectors, um, particularly in Ontario and Quebec. Um, and then, of course, things that more are affected, affecting your members um, are things like plant chemicals, landscape equipment. We obviously see lots of things like hardscapes, um, pebbles, gravel, um, broken and crushed stone, and then, of course, various nursery items. So things that, that are directly um, of, of use to, to landscapers, especially this time of year, are, are traveling very much traveling back and forth across the border. I think Canada is considered one of the major U.S. export markets for a lot of these products. So obviously the Americans are, are as concerned by some of these issues as are we. Um, so when we talk about supply chain problems and how COVID has caused all of this, I would say that that is, uh, it's, it's my general sort of argument today that COVID has, has merely exacerbated the problems, that these problems were long festering and COVID just sort of made them worse and exposed it all. At a, to a level of now where we're all talking about it and businesses are affected by it. And it's had this cascading uh, effect because it was just a public policy failure that hadn't been dealt with a long, long time. I think blaming COVID on every single problem in the supply chain uh, networks and the logistics networks that, that we are now seeing is sort of like, you know, not cleaning your house for an entire year and then having a rager on New Year's Eve and waking up the next morning and saying, oh, the party last night made my house a disaster. Um, and that's sort of the, the reality of, of where we're at now with, 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 with the supply chain issues. It sort of has been long festering, lack of dealing with it at, the, at various levels of government. This isn't to blame any single government or any single public policy. Um, these are problems that have been in existence for quite a while. And now we're just starting to see them sort of play out in time. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a few examples. Protectionism is obviously one of the long-standing issues that threatens and disrupts supply chains, highly integrated supply chains, and extends down into some of the transportation networks that we're now seeing uh, affected, trucking obviously being one of them. Um, you know, the, it's no secret that the Trump administration was a very protectionist. We renegotiated NAFTA. Um, the new administration that's come to power, um, I guess, a year and a half ago or so, the Biden administration, even more protectionist. And so they've started, whether it's by American policies, um, where they, they sort of choke off a lot of the supplier networks between Canada and the United States by incentivizing people to buy American. American firms that used to buy Canadian now will be forced to buy American so they can tap into some of these project, bid on these projects that the American government are providing and also some of the financial assistance programs that the American government are providing. So this actually has a disruptive effect. This is why you see business groups out there vehemently opposing these buy American policies. Um, we see there's tons of examples of them. Um, we saw it in electric vehicles. We've seen uh, some of the incentives that the U.S. is proposing to subsidize their own electric vehicles, which will threaten investment and supply chains in, in the auto sector, but also just software lumber tariffs and, and the Buy America provisions at the, at the public um, procurement level in the United States, and even all the, the, as I mentioned, all the financial assistance programs. So, so protectionism is bad because all of a sudden trucking companies and, and supplying um, in manufacturing input suppliers and things start to try to find sources um, not across the border and um, try to find them within their own country to try and take advantage of some of these programs. Um, so that's one thing is protectionism and, and reshoring has been slowly creeping for years and years and years. Um, and, and this has caused a lot of problems. Um, labor shortages is obviously a huge one. Um, for example, we now know in, um, in, uh, in trucking itself, um, the Canadian Trucking Alliance, I believe, says that they need 25,000 truck drivers in Canada this year, and they'll need over 50,000 by the end of next year. And so that's obviously a huge, huge labor shortage uh, problem. And obviously, there's a lot of things that, um, that get affected when you don't have enough drivers. Um, I think, according to the Business Development Bank of Canada, 55% of small and medium-sized businesses in Canada are struggling to hire the workers they need. Um, and this obviously businesses have, have started to scale back, halt ordering and production. This affects supply and chokes growth, and it happens in virtually every sector. So you could blame COVID, uh, but this has been going on for a long time, this sort of skills and labor shortage, and COVID just sort of made it worse. Um, and so this is this is uh, yet another example of, of things that need to be addressed by public policymakers. I think you see in the United States, 
they're introducing these apprenticeship programs to try and get truck drivers and they're trying to convince um, companies to renew fleets by new trucks and things like that so it's this this same approach is, is i think starting to take shape here as well um and then of course the lack of trade facilitating infrastructure um you've probably seen the photos of these container ships that are literally anchored and can't dock because they can't get enough they can't get enough and this is part of the labor shortage as well they can't get enough um workers to unload the ships so they just end up having to wait and, and wait and wait and wait and this has been a big problem. You can see this in American ports, especially. Um, but this is a problem in, in Canada too. Um, a few years ago, um, the World Bank ranked us near the bottom of 155 countries. They ranked Canada, I think, 150th when it comes to logistics efficiency. And, and that, that includes everything from ports, airports, and, and other gateways, including all the rail and trucking, and then container ship and, and air cargo sort of pieces that go with this. So Canada, we have all these ports. I think we have 18 official national ports and, and then a whole bunch of other sort of smaller ports, but, but all of them sort of lack a full investment in infrastructure to, um, to absorb new cargo and, and obviously to then sort of reduce some of the bottleneck issues. Um, so again, these are problems that aren't COVID related. These are longstanding problems in, in our sort of public policy and in our own uh, in our own sort of domestic situation, whether COVID happened or not, this idea that somehow you know every single problem is related because people were at home and all of a sudden they wanted to start doing home renovation projects and and you know everyone was buying buying wanting to buy lumber and everyone was wanting to uh, to do all this sort of do it yourself stuff during COVID is only partly true. Obviously, people did do that, but there's all sorts of public policy reasons that sort of just made this all sort of worse. Um, I'll say just some solutions in the medium and long term, and then we'll get to some solutions in the short term. Obviously, there's certain things when you look at the truck driver shortages. Um, obviously, there needs to be a greater government industry collaboration, both on renewing fleets, encouraging trucking and transportation companies to have more vehicles, to have more drivers, to recruit new drivers, to have training programs, apprenticeship programs, and all sorts of these things. Um, this is a, a medium or long term fix. That's not going to help anybody this season. Um, but that's that's one sort of example we, we would identify. Um, more focus on thinning the border um, through regulatory cooperation and reform. You see this again, um, where you see trucks lined up at the border trying to get through. There was all sorts of talk about trying to create, instead of a border, create like a security perimeter. So you could actually you get cleared and then you can drive through all these projects that have been announced and just never seem to go anywhere. Um, obviously, these nine need to be sort of exact enhanced in terms of their, their implementation um, because regulatory cooperation, regulatory reform is a huge issue. It's boring, it's complex, it's complicated, but it's absolutely necessary. And public policymakers on both sides of the border haven't, haven't done enough to, to move these issues forward. And of course, we even see provincial harmonization on various regulatory issues, especially in trucking. You see all sorts of issues related to, um, to trucking and transportation where there's a there's a rule in Alberta, there's a rule in Saskatchewan, there's a rule in Ontario, and um, and then so there's there's problems essentially when you get into a you know a 900 kilometer drive across borders, um, some of these issues start to actually become um, bottlenecks that are that are exacerbating the problems. And you even have people now that just say, I'm not going to, I'd rather drive an Ontario route into Atlantic Canada. I don't want to go out west because all of a sudden that triggers a whole new set of regulatory issues for my drivers. Um, in terms of driving time and, and some of those related things. So it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, there's lots of issues we could unpack all day long about some of those provincial, lack of provincial harmonization here in Canada. Um, and we can talk more about those if you like. Um, I'll just say solutions now. Everybody wants a solution for this season. Um, so, I mean, these aren't rocket science. And I certainly uh, think these are probably no brainer and you're already doing all these, but I think securing seasonal supply arrangements right now where possible we see some guys that are for example softwood lumber there's a lot of stuff going across the, the canada u.s border and softwood lumber our exports going to the united states and there these softwood lumber guys are locking down trucking and they're saying look you don't take on any other business we got enough sort of softwood lumber spruce mostly framing spruce and cedar and stuff like that and and so there's there's some deals going on where you're locking down some transportation um and carrier providers um sort of for the season, um, diversifying beyond current partnerships if possible. There's lots of trucking companies out of Quebec and Atlantic Canada. They're now trying to come up to Ontario to, to help sort of deliver the goods. Um, and there's a lot of examples. I think the Canadian Trucking Alliance is starting to try and connect some of those 
those groups, um, because apparently there's a bunch of fleets in Quebec that run sort of an Atlantic right through um, into Northern Ontario route, and they they are now recommending that they can maybe fill some of the some of the supply shortages that are in existence, and I think that are affecting some of the landscaping um, communities. So um, those are potential things to to uh, to consider. And then of course just figuring out what the long term advocacy efforts are to help shape these uh, medium and long term solutions and some of the public policy issues that I mentioned are are in bad need of reform. These are the types of things that need to happen um, over the medium and long term to make sure that there isn't one of these um, problems next time there's a there'll be if the pandemic's a, a great convenient excuse because everyone sort of has bought into it that it's a it's a problem but but again these were long festering long before COVID-19 and um, if we don't put permanent fixes in there'll be something else that that creates them next time and you know now we see COVID has happened and inflation's on the rise, price of gas is on the rise. So it's like a perfect storm um, and it making it hard for anybody that lives in a, in a, you know, where their profits rely on, on a margin um, to, 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 to continue to grow and to create jobs. And I think this is where it becomes a government problem just as much as a, as a business problem. And so um, these are some of the medium and long-term solutions we think um, should be considered in the, in the days and weeks ahead. Um, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say, Jamie. Um, but happy to happy to take some questions, and I'll put my email address in the uh, chat. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Adam. So you know, just to to kind of recap what what Adam is talking about, um, you know, logistical cost inflation. These are all things that are probably more highlighted as as, as issues today, but those are they're things that are going to be with us for a long time. Right. So when you see the number of truck drivers needed in Ontario at uh, 25,000 by now and 50,000 by the end of next year, right? This doesn't appear to be something that we can deal with in the short term and, and, it, and just have a very easy, quick solution, right? These are things that we need to, as a business, start planning for long term, right? So, you know, we typically in, in, our, in our industry, we are can be very project-based if we're not maintenance-based, right? So project-based means, um, you know, we need a certain allotment of goods for a certain date in order, to, in order to start a project or, you know, to complete a project. And in the past, we, we had the flexibility to be able to uh, work with those project timelines a lot looser. And uh, in today's supply chain slash, um, supply chain slash cost world, it is incredibly important that we are planning far, far in advance and communicating very clearly um, with our supply chain partners to make sure that we are able to meet the demands of our business. And so what we have had to do in, in our particular business, which is a supplier to the green industry, is we have had to reach out and we've had to find many, many different suppliers for traditional things that we would use uh, one specific supplier for. So to give one, one quick example, right, is uh, trying to get pipe into Canada or across Canada for irrigation. Um, you know, we used to be able to, to count on one, one logistical company and we knew what our, what our freight rates were and we knew what our, our reliability would be with that one particular vendor. I can tell you that today we use 16 different vendors for one manufacturer and we still, you know, d delays are, are consistent, costs fluctuate, right? It is, you know, we went from a, a sole source provider on our freight side to using 16 different vendors and it's not a very secure, um, secure supply chain. So what we've had to do is we've had to buy in advance as much as we can and take it as they can send it, right? We used to be able to say we need this um, by this date. Now, if they're willing to send a truck, we have to take it, right? So there is a tremendous impact on the supply chain from to your suppliers as it will be to you as, as, as the design builder maintenance contractors. So communication as soon as you can, as early as you can um, to all parts of your supply chain are gonna make you tremendously more reliable to your customer. And, um, you know, the, the other major impact you'll have is cost fluctuations. And again, with regular communication with your suppliers, you'll be able to understand what is pending cost increases and, and what, is, uh, what is not pending cost increase. We can understand 
what's going on in the world of surcharges, which I'm not going to get into right at the moment, because I think Ed and Ed and Peter are going to cover that um, at length. Um, but you know, Adam just highlighted a tremendous amount of logistical problems that the supply chain has, and there there is so many different ways we can deal with it. But the main thing we have to do is communicate with our supply chain partners, um, explore explore as many options as we can to deliver on the promises that we've made, and um, and and just um, please please remember that we're all in this together. We're all partners in the green industry, a green profession, right? Um, and we all wanna do the right thing for our end users, our customers and our public perception. So uh, communication is key, keep it coming. And uh, you know, it's gonna be another great year. It's gonna be a banner year for our industry. We just gotta stay ahead of everything as much as we can. So um, that's, all, that's all I wanted to say for now. Um, again, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions as we go um, and I, Ed and Peter have a, a very interesting topic that they want to get get uh, with you on. So I'll I'll uh, hand it over to you, Ed and Peter. Before uh, just before we jump over uh, and talk about the uh, landscape contractor side of the business, um, I was thinking about the exact same question that Tony put in the chat. Um, so maybe a question for both um, Adam and Jamie: How does Landscape Ontario help? in assisting um, in solving the logistics issue through collaboration. Is there anything that Landscape Ontario can do? I'll answer just quickly is I would get, um, if I, I'm sure you've done this, but if you have a survey of your members and just ask point blank, what is the, what is the number one problem you're facing right now? And just so we get some sort of, and then sort of the, sort of the, the results and figure out what is the top issues that your, your members are 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 looking for solutions for then quickly sort of deconstruct them back to is this a provincial government issue is this a federal government issue and then put some sort of submission together figure out which departments and ministers and and political senior you know public servants are that that have potential um solutions to them and and, and just start to advocate on 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 these issues because i think that's you know we're into a world now where hopefully in a post-pandemic situation where we have to start focusing on economic recovery and stuff and if you can find ways that, that these types of solutions if you can find solutions to this stuff then you know you're creating jobs and creating economic growth and and all that and i think politicians will, will listen thank you yeah and i i kind of see uh, maybe even collaborating with um the uh related trucking associations um on some of those issues so definitely something that we can dig into there yeah Wonderful. Um, I don't see any other questions in the uh, in the chat, and um, oh, I did see one more. Um, how does all of this affect those who are sole proprietor business landscapers? Yeah, I think we're going to get into exactly that part of the discussion as we move over and um, chat with um, Ed and Peter about um, how in their businesses they've uh, they've approached um, the rising costs of both fuel and logistics um, so on that note I'll, I'll say thank you to uh, adam and jamie um, please do stick around i feel like there's going to be some additional questions related uh, and i'm sure you'll be able to add additional color as we get into this conversation um, so peter and ed uh, maybe ed let's start with you um, uh, there's been lots of conversation, and I, I noticed in the um, the Landscape Ontario peer-to-peer -peer Facebook group. Um, also, a special note: if you haven't checked out that, that uh, Facebook group, please do. Uh, there's lots of uh, conversations on the daily, and um, uh, members will uh, post uh, certain issues and uh, situations that they're going through, and the community there offers a significant amount of assistance and guidance. So please do check that out. So Ed, uh, in that conversation, uh, there was a, um, a question about how uh, contractors are handling the rising fuel costs and you did um, kind of chime in and say, this is how we're doing it. It's kind of built, we have a, a, a contract way to deal with that. Would you mind kind of talking us, talking through that with us? Sure. Um, so a couple of things. One, you know, that peer to peer, you know, it's interesting because the questions come up and and there are always related things for all of us, right? Fuel obviously affects all of us. Um, 
And the other thing too is that you know we see gas go from like say a dollar twenty up to a buck seventy, and all of a sudden you know this is a massive you know forty fifty percent increase on something. And you know what do we want to do? You know, oh my gosh, I'm going to raise all my prices forty to fifty percent. Well, the reality is is that fuel is a portion of your business, right? And I think that if you've done your numbers and you understand your numbers, then you know that's the first place to start always before I say this. So no matter what I say, my numbers might be very different than other people. So, for an example, you know I know one company that does a formula for a fuel threshold, where they uh, they take the actual price per liter. Uh, and then they divide it by the amount, you know, the cost of fuel, and then how many liters, you know, they're burning on a run, and then they charge it that way. I don't know. It, you can get a little bit complicated, but regardless, some uh, there's maintenance parts, and then there's you know build, and then there's project parts, just like uh, James was saying. And I think for different people in your contracts, uh, in our case, quite simply. Uh, we have two things written into our contract. So one um, is that we actually write that a fuel charge, and in our case, uh, we say 6.5% uh, is implemented on fuel when it's above X amount of dollars per liter. And that will be calculated based on delivery, transportation, and your invoice, not material and labor. So in other words, when we're saying, you know, we don't want clients to think that we're showing up and everything is increased in price. We look at it as a partnership with everybody that we're working with. And we don't want a partner to think that we're just charging them willy nilly some random number that we come up with. So each year when we review it, we sort of say, okay, fuel is this price right now. What happens if it goes to this and it stays there for longer than 10 days? So in this case, we've reached that threshold. It's gone past that. So actually, oddly enough, when we did our uh, snow contracts last year, uh, we said that our threshold was a dollar forty-five, so we've obviously gone way past that now. Same thing then for us in our projects or in our um, construction jobs. What we do is we say that oddly enough, we have a breakout where we have material prices increasing uh, based on the price, and then fuel prices increase based on the price at the time of the project. So. Everybody knows, you, you know, one portion of anything can go up in price in a year or in a few months. And, you know, you listen to, I mean, I'm sure for James, that's got to be a nightmare. You know, you got 16 different companies uh, trying to deal with them and, and costs for that. I mean, as the end user in our case, um, you know, whatever a supplier is getting it to you, getting it to them, well, then prices go up. We have to charge that. The other reality in that though is, anyway, we, we put in a threshold, we put the fuel number in, and we say that if it surpasses that number when we, at the time of your project, that it could impact it. Now, even if you use electric um, or battery powered equipment, the reality is, is that you still have to get to and from your job sites and, you, and your staff still need to uh, drive around. So there, there has to be fuel costs that are associated, your suppliers, uh, just today, oddly enough, I had two suppliers send me a, a note, uh, not just me, but a generalized note to just talk about their increases. And oddly enough, one of theirs was exactly the same 6.5 that we charged. So um, hopefully I explained that fairly well. I, I just think that the reality is, is you have to know your own numbers first. That's the most important part. Just randomly assuming that, you know, gas goes up 50 cents. Well, I'm going to charge everything up. At that price obviously if you're in a partnership with clients you you can't do that but the other reality one last thing is you have to do it if you're going to put it out there and you're going to say you're going to do it do it uh customers get used to it they see it they understand it that for you to be in business that they need you to be there and be and provide quality service so for you to do that you do need to charge now in our case, let's say, for an example, in Ottawa with a snow contract, um, might be tough. Tail end of the year, I don't know how you would really uh, impact it unless you were doing a per load charge for removal, which, of course, at this point, not happening. Nobody's going to remove uh, freezing rain or, uh, or rain right now. Um, but generally speaking, that's how we do it. We do write it in, and it isn't just a COVID thing. We had it involved beforehand. And the other thing that I have heard from some uh, Landscape Ontario members is I want to charge extra. How do I do it? Okay, well, is it written in your contract? 
And if they say no, then you can't just turn around to your clients and say on a, something that's already happened or that you've agreed upon, you'd have to change it moving forward. So again, I'm not a legal expert. You'd have to get a lawyer on that one. But that, that was the biggest piece of advice I had. I was surprised that uh, the number of people that had nothing written into their contracts about it. So I think it's, you know, know your numbers, uh, look forward, not backwards. If you've made a mistake and you didn't put it in, that's okay. Now look forward from this point forward and, and move on from here. Think about it that the last month, you probably haven't really been rolling your vehicles the same way you normally would and be thankful for it. Uh, and then, you know, moving forward, try to implement those costs adjustments. But on the same note too, if you're going to have a flex up, maybe make your clients aware that there can be a flex down. It'll make them feel good, you know, make them also part of the game that if it's going up to $1.80, sure, you might charge this. And then going back down, if it went back down to, you know, say $1.40, okay, well, is that going to happen? I don't really know. <laughs> Obviously, I don't think so, but that's another thing. Um, the other thing, too, that I have seen, too, one other last thing is that I have seen some client, um, some members or peers in particular, where they have a range. So if they say that it's um, gas is, you know, $1.80 or greater than $1.80, but less than $1.85, it's 3%. And I just use 3% as a number. If it's a certain number to a certain number, it's this percent. If it's a certain number to a certain number, it's this percent. So I would say that's probably it for me in terms of uh, how we view it. Um, certainly open to, I'm sure Peter has a, even more elaborate system. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, to walk us through that. Um, I know that that's uh, beneficial for many of those that are here today. Uh, Peter, uh, why don't we come over to you? Um, we've had uh, some conversations um, over the past little while about um, how things are done at Oriole and um, kind of your philosophy on um, what this all looks like. So I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thanks, Joe. And uh, and I have the easy job coming in last because James, Adam, and Ed covered at least half of what I had planned to talk about. So I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I do have a, a list that I made just so I don't forget anything that I wanted to share with you today. And uh, I'm going to share my screen so that we can look at that together. Um, and uh, fine. All right. So to the point that uh, Ed mentioned at the beginning of his talk, where uh, you have to know your numbers, uh, that is obviously key to all of our strategies. And what we're talking about today, uh, to Adam's point, is not specifically COVID related. These are things you should be doing all the time already. And if you haven't been, then you start. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today is I wanted to use these high prices in fuel as a clarion call to cut waste in your business. As Ed was saying, the, uh, the numbers, fuel isn't really a huge individual cost on your bottom line. I checked my numbers. Fuel for me last year was 1.28% of my costs. So uh, if there's a 50% increase in fuel this year, that would make it 1.85% of my costs. Not huge. It is. It is a lot of money. It's, it's going to be like an extra $50,000 this year, and I want that money back. So I do have some strategies to get that money back, to recoup that money. Um, but the most important thing, the biggest expense on my P&L last year was labor. 32.9% was my labor expense last year. So if I'm trying to save money on anything, the easiest and most effective way to save money is to look at your labor costs. And uh, I'm just gonna quickly show this, this uh, seven types of lean manufacturing. I stole this off the internet from somewhere. We use this uh, seven types of waste in our Kaizen lean 
uh, training at Oriel. The most expensive costs is wasted transportation, wasted motion. If you have a crew and you forget a two by four going to a job site and you have to send that crew out to Home Depot or back to your yard to get that two by four, the biggest cost is the labor for the driver in that truck. And if you need to use the high fuel costs as the as your flag to draw attention to those costs, then by all means. I've been trying to reduce wasted motion for years. I still have, I still have uh, staff members that'll go to Home Depot to pick up some screws because they didn't plan to bring the right screws to the job site that day. And it drives me crazy. They don't think they're being unproductive because they needed the screws to get the job done and they got the job done, you know, by hook or by crook, they got it done. And, uh, but every crew member now is hearing these, these newspaper news, nobody reads the newspaper anymore. These news articles on, uh, on, on the radio about how high fuel costs are. They see it on every street corner. There's a, uh, there's a, a billboard basically on every gas station telling you how high fuel costs are that brings their attention to fuel costs. If you tell your staff it's a waste of money to drive to the Home Depot to get those screws, be more careful in your planning. Uh, drive home the importance of efficiency and to reduce wasted motion. I guarantee you, you will save way more in labor than the premium you're paying on fuel. You will save a little bit of fuel as well, but that's really a... Uh, a the small, the, you know, the, the small part of your savings. So obviously reduce trips to your yard and suppliers during the day. I have, I have 10 or 11 items on here and uh, I'm gonna go through them quickly and we've covered many of them already. But obviously reducing trips to your yard and suppliers during the day will save you some gas. It'll save you a lot on labor, way more than you're spending in gas. Uh, ensure backhauling as often as possible. So I have some big trucks. When I go to dump my, my uh, concrete, my waste, my soil, I'm always backhauling aggregate, new soil, new materials back to my yard. That means I'm paying half as much for the trip for each delivery when I'm doing my own. So when that's possible. Uh, select the smallest practical vehicle for the task. So if you don't need a triaxle truck to go pick up some lumber, then you know send the right size truck. That'll save you a little bit. These are easy things, but you know this the the high fuel costs should bring your attention to these. It'll make it easier for you to remember these things. It'll make it easier for your staff to stay focused on this. Um, this was what I talked about earlier. It's ten times more costly to be short a two by four on a job than to have an extra one. So when you're planning for your job, put a little extra material in your estimate. Make sure you deliver 5% more interlock to your job or 10% more interlock than you've accounted for. Because if you're short, the wasted time and labor to drive around to get that little bit of brick is gonna, is gonna blow your budget, not the fuel. Uh, idling, you know, Crew members may or may not leave the vehicles running. I've never done that. I've always been cheap that way, but uh, you know, maybe that's something that you can you can clamp down on if it's if it's a problem in your company. We have on-site fuel tanks in our yard. We don't save money when we buy our fuel in bulk, but we do save time. I don't have my crew members going to a gas station in the morning on their way to a job site and sitting in a lineup to get fuel or pay for fuel. They fuel up at the end of the day when they get back to the yard, they unload, they make sure their uh, truck is topped up so they're out of the yard quickly in the morning and they avoid uh, traffic getting to a job site. They get to the job site by seven o'clock so they avoid traffic. Sitting in traffic is a waste of time and money. So if you can cut your labor costs. So I, I get... Uh, dyed diesel for my equipment. I save 12 cents a liter on dyed diesel because I have a tank in my yard. Again, it's not huge, 
but having having those things filled for the for the crew when they're idling at the yard at the end of the day, or I have somebody assigned to make sure all the tanks are full, like the the little uh, twenty liter tanks for the hand tools. Uh, that saves time. Uh, electric equipment. So we've got electric equipment for our maintenance, but again, like Ed said, we'd use a gas truck to get there and back. But there is a bonus, right, where it's less noisy, it adds to our brand, it saves some fuel. So if this is the impetus to move to electric, then uh, then it's gonna be a win-win. Uh, increasing your pricing, we've talked about that already. It is necessary. We did it last year, we did it twice last year, and, uh, and we're prepared to do it again. Don't wait you know, for annual uh, budget reviews. Uh, we talked about surcharges again already, so include the option. You have to put that in your estimates and in your contracts, like Ed said. Uh, we have our threshold was $1.50 a liter. We're putting a surcharge on the entire invoice amount because we wanted to make it as simple as possible to do the math. So if fuel exceeds $1.50 per liter, we have a 1% fuel surcharge on our invoices. And uh, unfortunately, we have some legacy projects that were on massive jobs that we signed contracts for in 2020 that we're finishing this spring, I have no option to add for those. So uh, we're getting through those this year. Uh, this is one we haven't talked about yet, pay your vendors early. I have some vendors that give us a 2% discount if we pay in 15 days. That is the best return on your money that you'll get anywhere. If you can reduce your material costs by 2%, Again, that offsets delivery surcharges. Um, I didn't write on this list here, we talked about uh, buying for your season. Uh, last year we bought $60,000 worth of lumber in by the lift because lumber prices were going crazy last spring. We got all our lumber pricing early. We, we secured our lumber for our jobs early. We got it at a good price. Um, Purchase what you can as soon as you can. Buy it in bulk if you can uh, to keep those costs down. And then uh, this last point here, uh, future costs are uncertain. Client pays for the material costs. So we add allowances. Some of the quotes that we do, we're pricing for next year. And we have no idea where prices will be next year. And more than just a surcharge for fuel, we need to make sure we cover for unforeseen cost increases in steel or porcelain tile or what have you. Oftentimes we'll put an allowance in, you know, $12,000 for the tile or $12 a square foot for the interlock that we're uh, using here. If the price goes up to $14 next year, when we do the job, I can notify the client. This is what the actual cost is. I can pass that cost along. So in your quotes and in your contracts, you have material allowances. And, uh, and that gives you an option to charge what the material is actually worth when you come to do the job. And back to my first point and Ed's point, pay attention to your financials. They will pay you back. That was, that's hopefully catchy little note and uh, help us, help us uh, remember. No doubt. What a fantastic list, Peter. Thank you. Sounds like a uh, an article for the next Landscape Ontario magazine uh -oh. is sitting right there. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, so I, I, I would encourage um, everyone that's with us today, if you have questions, please do put those in the chat. Um, I am going to uh, kick off um, with a few questions um, uh, for Ed and um, Peter. Um, when you do have um, and introduce those uh, price increases uh, in the fuel surcharges, and I know this has been a question um, inside that peer-to-peer uh, -peer Facebook community, what does the conversation look like with the clients? Is it a conversation or is it a notice? And how does that happen? I think it's a conversation. And uh, what I would suggest is it's a, you know, it's like anything you, you, you kind of have a, two different ways. You can always go in with the, I'm so sorry that I have to do this and you know, that sort of thing. 
I'm not a big fan of that. I personally think that it's a matter of fact and it's a, but it's a positive statement, you know, uh, we've had a really good season and as I'm sure you're aware, gas prices have gone through the roof and um, you know, as I'm sure you're aware in our contract, it says that we're going to be able to charge this. I wanted to give you the heads up that this is going to happen. And as long as you're aware of that, um, you know, we, we should be fine moving forward. You might get some pushback, but in truth, um, and, and Peter alluded to it as well, you know, it's not, people don't assume like the points that Peter made about idling and having fuel in your yard and things like that. I'm not sure every client really recognizes what we do to minimize costs to begin with. So, you know, it's not uh, like you're showing up and it's just, you know, you got a fuel hanging out. Nobody wants to spend money on gas. And if we can, we, you know, obviously same as Peter, uh, some of our maintenance crews have gone all electric too. And uh, you know what? That's a huge thing. Still got to get to the job. So, you know, those are, those are the kind of things, but I think it's a conversation and I think it's just an honest one. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, everybody's aware, you know, in our contracts, just like Peter was mentioning in his as well, uh, we put in that if materials go above uh, a certain price, so we, yes, we've priced them at a certain rate, but if we say that they are gone up in an increase of 5%, we have the right to reprice the project, but they also have the right to refuse the project. So if we, you know, put it together and price it out, they've given a deposit on a, you know, easy math, a hundred thousand dollar job. And if uh, prices go up 5% over top of that, we have the right to go through it, price it out for them, or they also have, you know, obviously have the right to, to turn it down, which gives them that you got to give them something. If you're taking something, you know, you put it in, but the fuel one, it's a conversation. That's what I would suggest. Great. Thanks, Ed. Peter? You know. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, people to people having that conversation makes a lot of sense. Uh, as a follow up. If sorry, if I could just add, just add to that. Yeah, Joe yeah. And, people and, and Ed. Um, you know, I, I spoke earlier about communication with your suppliers. And I mean, it, it's a two way street, right? And um, I know almost every supplier I've seen out there is communicating in some fashion or form what is happening with price and costs in the industry in a very professional document that you can easily present um, to your customers to justify, right? So it is an easy conversation for you to have. And I mean, maybe not easy, but it is a conversation that you need to have with your customers if your costs are increasing. And I just want, I want everybody to understand that you can, you have the ability to find documentation to justify everything that you're saying that is specific to our industry uh, and specific to the the, the uh, materials that you're you're using and that the costs are rising on. So reach out reach out to any of your supplier partners, and uh, there's plenty of documentation out there to help you um, justify or reprice, requote um, your your work. And also, you know, as you said, Ed and Peter both said they had thresholds. Um, you know, the thresholds are being literally blown out of the water, typically on on cost increases. Uh, just a small example. We used to get uh, cost increases with 60, 90, 120 days notice. We're getting them now with 10 days notice. We're getting surcharges added with an email. As of now, surcharges added. Yeah. Thank you. One, one for thing that. to add to that, uh, James, is you're right, right? That's it, it's, expect, it's almost expected now. You know, um, you get an email this morning saying, oh, and by the way, <laughs> you know, as of this date. So the conversation is nice, but. You know, James is 100% right. You're going to get people who just, they can't manage to uh, certain cost increases. And what, one thing just to jump is um, Kevin has in the chat about how do you price the time needed to go back and forth during contract revisions. Um, what I do is I put key metrics in the revision previous. So if I'm pricing a job out, so say for an example, right now we're pricing things for 2023. And when we're pricing them, I will put in the cost of the major materials. I will actually have them so ours, we have a, an actual process to doing it where you can actually see this is where it's key to know your numbers that the paver that I priced out was this price at the time when I did the price. Fuel is this price. And then it, it just makes it a lot easier. 
But just to go even one step further, and maybe I'm super crazy, but we actually put in a percentage increase uh, for the end of the job. So if we price a job out today, um, and obviously for an example, inflation right now is 5.1%, or at least last time I looked. Uh, so if that's the, the cost, then I add that or I fluctuate the number for the increase and allowed for it. So in other words, if the job's 100, then I make it 105. And then that way it's less of an up and down. No, we already factored for that in your pricing and we've got that covered. It's just, I'd rather not disappoint them. I'd rather lose a job than disappoint them in the end as well. Thank you. So we do have a, uh, another question that uh, came in um, and it's for those uh, landscape companies that are encour encouraging their staff to drive their own vehicles to job sites. Um, as in particular, a maintenance company um, in staff moving from site to site, how do you suggest that um, staff are paid uh, through the season, especially as fuel prices are going up? Well, I know we, Peter? yeah, sorry, Ed. Uh, like we do pay our staff per kilometer. We did raise it this year. We were paying 50 cents last year. We raised it to 55 in January. We're probably gonna have to raise it again, but I would really wanna discourage my staff again from driving unnecessarily. Our goal in my company is for staff that drive their own vehicle to drive to a job site and drive home from the job site, not be driving around during the day. Our maintenance vehicle, we have company vehicles for maintenance. So I don't have staff driving their individual vehicles around anymore. We've cut that out for this year. And uh, and like we're obviously just trying to reduce, minimize the number of kilometers driven in total. So. Kind of funny, it's almost like Peter and I hang out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, same. We're we're we don't want uh, staff driving their own vehicles anymore. Um, and then one of the thoughts that we've actually introduced is probably like all of us, our staff might live further and further away from uh, where they have to go in the morning. So we've looked into um, like a you know a fuel compensation for anybody that's a certain distance from our shop. Um, that's helped uh, travel in a lot. And in truth, I mean, as I'm sure we all know, uh, it's not like we're running and getting, uh, you know, 400 employees knocking down your door right now. So you got to do what you can to keep the ones uh, happy that are there. But similar to Peter, um, we, don't, we don't want our staff driving vehicles anymore to job sites unless it's a permanent site. In other words, if they're going to a job site that we're going to be on for, I don't know, four to six weeks, let's say, and uh, they might uh, they might drive there. They don't need to get anywhere, but that to me is no different than them busing to work. So they would bus to the job site, stay there all day. When they leave, they don't have to come back to the shop. They just hop up on a bus. Um, the other thing is, all jokes aside, I would strongly encourage public transit <laughs> more and more because um, we are seeing that the costs aren't going as crazy as um, as they are for fuel costs like Uber just went up. So that's one, even though I know that's not public. And, uh, but uh, here, at least in Ottawa, uh, bus rates haven't gone through the roof as of yet. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Peter. Um, looks like uh, just a, uh, another question came in from uh, Russell Springer. Manufacturing costs are increasing due to fuel costs, but they're not indicating these costs will come down. Should your fuel surcharge be a permanent cost also? Your fuel surcharge stays, it just elevates. You leave the number as a, as a constantly uh, living number. So if fuel is 90 cents when you do a contract, I mean, I mean, yes, we might see it come down slightly, but it's never going to come back down. In the manufacturing, I remember, you know, when you know, I'm going to admit that I'm this old, uh, you know, when GST came in and then, you know, manufacturer's tax was going down because of GST and HST, it never changed. They left it up, uh, the price up. Once they, once they were able to achieve that price, they're not coming back down. So I think that you need to continuously monitor your numbers and then know the cost of your fuel and then where you feel it goes up and where it goes down. 
And also another thing you can do is understand whether those surcharges that you're being charged are going out in your cost of goods sold, right? So if you're talking about you, your usage of fuel, that's a different surcharge than the surcharges you might see coming in on cost of goods. So understand that, you know, fuel charges, surcharges on cost of goods are going to probably become more permanent if the fuel prices don't go down. And that will not be an additional line item. That will be part of the cost of goods. So understand the difference between your fuel usage in a surcharge and all the impacts on the different steps in the chain of supply uh, and those surcharges on your cost of goods. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to our time. Uh, but before I do uh, let you go, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't let you know that through your membership at Landscape Ontario, you do have access to some fuel savings. So that's Petro Canada, Esso, Pioneer, Ultramar, Chevron, and Fast Gas, all right around three cents a liter uh, as part of your membership. So if you uh, if you are looking on how to access those, those are through um, the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association. Uh, so if you uh, hit their website, canonursery.com, um, and uh, head over to Benefits of Membership, uh, you will see all of those uh, programs. Uh, of course, uh, here at Landscape Ontario, our staff can help you navigate that, and uh, we can definitely help get access to those savings so definitely leverage landscape ontario to help uh, you manage some of those expenses um ed peter jamie i know adam had to uh, leave he teaches a course uh at four o'clock so uh, you know on behalf of uh, the landscape ontario covid 19 task force landscape ontario and board of directors thank you so much each of you for your time and your expertise and for all of you that uh, joined us today, uh, I hope you found value in this. And uh, again, if you do have any questions, please do connect with us. And I'm sure that uh, we can get some of these fantastic uh, experts in their field to, uh, to answer your questions. And if you haven't joined the Landscape Ontario peer-to-peer -peer Facebook group, please do that. The, uh, the resource is incredible. Thank you all. Take care and can't wait to see you next time. <laughs>